recording this broadcast and posting it on our website for later. Um, we would love to have you turn your camera on if you're feeling uh, like it today. And we, there will be some time in the end for some questions. So let's go ahead and get started. So some quick notes, uh, if you could please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Um, if you can keep it muted, it just helps with the audible sound for today's Lunch and Learn. If you would like to turn on captions, you can go to the bottom of your screen and use the live transcripts button. Also, again, make sure that you do save your questions. You can put them in the chat. This is a very interactive uh, Lunch and Learn. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your comments, your questions. And of course, it's a great opportunity to speak with um, our guest today, who is Troy Williams from Equality Utah. So uh, again, put those questions in the chat, or you can save them Hello. and ask them at the end. Um, we are going to be posting a survey in the chat, so we would kind of near the end when we get to the Q&A, we would love to have your feedback about today's Lunch and Learn. So please do take just a few short minutes and fill out that survey as it helps us improve our programming. So today's agenda for the Lunch and Learn, we've got uh, our speakers uh, lined up. We have Mayor Mendenhall, who will be giving a um, welcome to the event. And then, of course, we'll be talking with Troy Utah, Executive Director for Equality Utah. And I, myself, again, am Angel H. Brown, the Executive Director for Craft Lake City. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Amy Stocks, our Community Inclusion Coordinator, who is here today helping me run today's event. Amy will be moderating the chat and uh, calling on individuals for questions um, after we finish the discussion. So thank you so much today, Amy, for your support and our placat, placat partners. We've got Equality Utah, as you know, and KRCL 90.9 FM, Center for the Living City, and Temporary Museum of Permanent Change. So I'd like to just chat before we, before we begin a little bit about Craft Lake City, about our organization and who we are. For those of you that aren't familiar with Craft Lake City, our mission is to educate, promote, and inspire local artisans while elevating the creative culture of the Utah arts community through science, technology, and art. And one of the ways that we do that is by hosting um, our large scale annual Craft Lake City Do It Yourself Festival at the Utah State Fair Park. And with the pandemic kind of, um, you know, kind of coming to an end and with all of the vaccinations being rolled out, we're so excited to announce that this will be an in-person event this year on August 13th, 14th and 15th. So please do join us for that. We also produce a holiday market up in Ogden um, that is the first weekend of every uh, December. And we also offer uh, Craft Lake City virtual programming, which has been very popular during the pandemic, of course, um, where you can actually log onto our website and learn how to create and make from some of Utah's finest makers. Also part of our virtual programming, we offer um, STEM online workshops and um, craft workshops for a nominal fee. Uh, Another way that we execute our mission is today's project, what we're talking about, one of our curation projects, which is our local voices. Um, we know our local voices is part of a curation project down in downtown Salt Lake City that runs along Broadway on 300 South between 200 East and 200 West. And this is actually, where, as you can see, we have these metal steel frames that are placed along the sidewalk for um, essentially residents and visitors to have an experience with the organization. And we do that with artisans through our celebration of the hand, which is illustrated on the left. And then we do that with other nonprofit partners, such as today's partnership with Equality Utah, where we amplify their voice and the work that they are doing in the community. So I'd like to go ahead and get us started with today's topic and welcome Mayor Mendenhall. <coughs> She's produced a video for us in advance as she couldn't be here today due to her hectic schedule. So we'll go ahead and watch her welcome. Looks like it's just a game. Hello, Salt Lake City, and welcome to Craft Lake City and Equality Utah's Lunch and Learn event. I love our local arts and civil rights organizations, and I especially love when they team up together to organize important conversations like this one. In Salt Lake City, we take equity seriously, and my team is working hard to make sure our city programs, our projects, and all of our procedures are structured in a way that they give all our residents equal footing. In fact, we just hired the city's first ever chief equity officer, Coletta Lynch. 
She is fabulous. She knows the city in and out, and she has the ample experience in this field to lead an equity team dedicated to improving access and opportunities for all our residents. I hope that you enjoy this discussion and that you'll stop by the outdoor installation, Local Voices, 20 Years of Equality Utah, along Broadway between 2nd West and 2nd East. I've seen it myself and I think it's such a powerful reminder of how far we've come as a city, as a state and as a nation, thanks to the dedicated efforts of brave individuals and organizations like Equality Utah. So thank you, Mayor Mendenhall. We appreciate you recording that video for us and being part of this discussion today. So again, we've got uh, Quality Utah here today, Executive Director Troy, Troy Williams. Troy, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Troy Williams. My pronouns are he and him, and I've been the Director of Equality Utah for the past oh, six going on seven years now. <laughs> thank you so much, Troy. So let's talk a little bit about our partnership. Now, this is the third year that Craft Lake City and Equality Utah have been working together to essentially showcase um, you know, this, your work, the work of Equality Utah on the city streets of Salt Lake City. So why is it important for organizations like Equality Utah to team up with arts organizations like Craft Lake City? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's essential that we create this beautiful city together. And, you know, I, I think when we talk about social justice and we talk about all of, of the change that's happened, it's often through the vehicle of art, through the vehicle of storytelling, uh, whether it's in theater or music um, and, and any, any kind of graphic display where we begin to tell stories that open people's hearts. And when hearts open up, then mindsets, attitudes begin to shift. And once the mindset shifts, then public policy begins to change as well. So it's absolutely essential. Every single so successful social movement has also aligned itself with the arts community in order to sort of get these messages out. And it's really about creating empathy between different groups of people uh, so that we can see what we have in common, see the values that we share and see that we're all on this journey through life together. Thank you, Troy, and thank you so much for sharing that. And that is exactly the reason why we love partnering with you and why it's so important for us to, you know, essentially amplify the work that you do. And I'm, you know, part of this walking tour, um, you know, these plugouts are downtown, they're spread out over several different, um, you know, blocks in downtown Salt Lake City, so you can literally walk to them. And we teamed up with our partners at KRCL, and they helped some of your board members record some stories that go along with each placat. And so we, we're now kind of looking at our founder's vision placat, which talks about the history. Do you want to kind of set this up and then we'll hear a little audio quote? Yeah, yeah. And I love that this is, I think a couple of days after we installed this, we got some graffiti. So some local artists <laughs> wanted to be part of the installation. So they jumped on board. I think uh, the graffiti artist may have been Jim DeBacchus. I'm not sure. Um, but the, our founder's vision, like, so back 20 years ago, um, so Jim DeBacchus, uh, who a lot of you know, former state senator, uh, Doug Wortham and Michelle Turpin, they were really frustrated with the, the kind of current political scene and the lack of access that our community had and the inability for us to really harness uh, the political and the economic power of our community to create change. So they got together over, over uh, dinner and, and talked about it. And after that, uh, they formed Unity Utah, which in a couple of years evolved to become Equality Utah. And then now we can cue up the uh, audio clip from Jim DeBacchus. Hi, it's Jim DeBacchus. It was 20 years ago that I and a couple of friends created Equality Utah originally called Unity Utah. I started Equality Utah because the Salt Lake City Council turned down my volunteer committee service um, because they didn't feel like anyone like me ought to be representing the city. They didn't feel anybody that was LGBTQ ought to be representing the city, even on a voluntary committee. So I told the mayor I was happy that I, you know, that I it didn't hurt to not be pointed to this committee, uh, and that I would withdraw my name. And he said, "You will not withdraw that name." And for a couple of days, I was fine with it. And then I started getting steamed 
I called uh, my two friends, Michelle Turpin and Doug Wortham, and said, we're going to start a political organization. And we met and had a, a brunch at Cafe Orbit, and that was the beginning. Imagine in Salt Lake City, the city council refused an LGBTQ person who was out to serve the city on a voluntary committee. My knowledge was that there were many, many uh, queer people in Salt Lake City, and it wasn't like the rest of the state, and that if we would organize, we could have political weight, and we could have a place at the table of power in Salt Lake City. That was the purpose of uh, starting Unity Utah, and that's what we did. The landscape uh, in Utah has changed dramatically, and from a political stance, a lot of that is a direct result of uh, Equality Utah and their integration within the fabric of the political structure of the state. It's, it's phenomenal, but the queers are a force in Utah politics, and especially in Salt Lake City and in Salt Lake County. You know, you, you can't stop the beat and you cannot silence the LGBTQ community here in Utah. I'll tell you, what, and, I, and I'll tell you, for two decades, we've had people trying and they've always failed. It's and and we are happy to be part of you know this project amplifying the LGBTQ plus voice on the city streets. It's more important um, now than ever. And my goodness, how important it is for us to learn about what it was like 20 years ago and about you know the work that a lot of these individuals have done to get us where we are today. Like this story from Jim DeBacchus, even in our own city council 20 years ago. Well, look at the change now. In two decades, right now, the Salt Lake City Council has three out LGBTQ council members, right? That's phenomenal. And as Mayor Mendenhall said earlier, Coletta Lynch is taking on this great new, brand new position uh, in, in overseeing equity for the city. This is a tremendous uh, uh, sort of leap over two decades. It seems like a long time, but it's actually, you know, in, in the sort of arc of social justice, it's relatively fast. Uh, so incredibly grateful to see uh, how much has changed. Well, and how important is that? You know, you know, you mentioned Mayor Mendenhall and kind of in the beginning, her talking about, you know, having that new position, that new kind of appointed position. Um, how important is it for chief equity officers to be part of, you know, city governments or state governments? It's essential and it's so important to have, bring people to the table. There is an activist ethos that we all uh, subscribe to called nothing about us without us. When policies are being considered that impact a marginalized or a minority community, we need to be at the table to make that sure that that happens. And so seeing uh, Mayor Mendenhall take the lead on that, recognizing that, um, appointing Coletta Lynch is phenomenal. And Coletta is phenomenal. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, to have her voice and her input shaping the future of the city. I'm also really excited that, that the state government in the Governor Cox's administration has also prioritized equity, diversity, and inclusion and has a cabinet uh, position, level position, uh, overseeing that. Uh, very important issue. So we're seeing this now on, on the municipal and also on, on the state level, uh, a commitment to, um, to racial equality, to LGBTQ equality, like we never have seen before in the history of this state. And that's very exciting. Very exciting. Let's, anything else you'd like to say about this kind of founder's vision before we move on to looking at some of the other work? Yeah, I'm just really grateful um, for Jim and, and Michelle and Doug and for all of the founding board members of Equality Utah. I mean, they, they call it Bruce Bastion and, and he wrote the first check uh, for Equality Utah. So for all of the, the early forefathers and mothers who, uh, who had the vision to see what could be, um, we stand on your shoulders and I am so grateful to, to all of you. Agreed, 100%, Troy. You know, are there other organizations like Equality Utah in other states? You know, is yeah. Equality Utah kind of unique to Utah or are there other, can, yeah, do other states? We have? actually belong to what's called the Equality Federation, and that is the network of all of the state equality groups around the country. And I think there's over 30 of us. It's not quite 50. Um, for example, there is an Equality Arizona. There's a Wyoming Equality. Uh, in my home state of Oregon, there's Basic Rights Oregon. 
Um, Idaho doesn't have one um, yet, uh, but so that, yeah, we, we are networked together. Uh, we meet regularly, annually, and, and we discuss the issues that we're all facing and we help each other out. Um, and well, I can tell a little bit about, about how we do that a little bit later down uh, part of this presentation. So yeah, it's really, um, it, it is important that we are all sort of supporting each other throughout the country, especially as we've seen this year with a wave of anti-LGBT legislation being um, introduced in state houses all across the country. We're all working together as a team, uh, helping each other out. Well, and I, I um, really love uh, with these this outdoor exhibition, the kind of empowering headlines that Equality uses uh, Equality Utah uses, for instance, on this one, you know, the power of we. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that and how important, you know, that type of language is in your work, especially kind of your your, your out facing public campaigns? Yeah, you know, I think you know, we're dealing, we are existing in this great age of isolation right now. And, and sadly, it seems like social media, at, instead of actually connecting us together, is actually doing more to drive us apart, to make us more tribal, to make us more insular, to make us more suspicious of our neighbors. And not only suspicious of our neighbors, we think that other Americans are our enemies. And this is ripping our country apart. And I, just, our team at Equality Utah just believes very strongly that we've got to focus on the things that we share in common and we have to identify shared values, even with people who don't share our same ideological perspectives. And we have to do that together. Um, this isn't, this isn't a, uh, the, the work that we accomplished and the success that we have, this isn't something that I, Troy, had done myself. There's, there's an amazing team of people and there have been for decades. I mean, so we've had organizers uh, long before Equality Utah was formed here in Utah who were fighting and marching in the streets and, and forming the first pride parades. Um, there, was, there was a group called uh, Queer Nation um, back in the 80s. It was a little bit more radical. And there was a group called Queer Nation Utah. Um, and our dear friend and elder, uh, Connell Donovan was part of that. Without Connell's contribution, uh, there is no Troy Williams, right? And without my contribution, the next generation of, of advocates and activists don't have the infrastructure and the foundation they need to be successful. So we're all working together as one big giant we. And uh, I just really believe that as our, as our company ethos is that we are just committed to bringing people together. And this placard really shows that very well, these nice little headshots of a lot of the individuals that are working hard today for this work. Yeah, and this is our yeah, this is our current our board. Uh, we have a PAC board, and we have a 501c3 board, and some of our staff members are here. And it's just this beautiful, vibrant uh, uh, members. That actually, this is that, these are these are the people that currently comprise Equality Utah. Also, members of our Transgender Advisory Council are there, and, and it's just it's an amazing team. And this specific placot you can find down by the Broadway Theater. And uh, for those that they're kind of wondering, what is this term placat that I keep bringing up? So this is one of our, our partner that we actually work with for this exhibition, the Temporary Museum of Permanent Change came up with that term. And it's essentially the German word for, you know, kind of um, billboard in this sort of still frame. And these are, you know, billboard, billboards that are filled with works of art and also filled with these important social justice messages. So uh, let's move on to the next one. Equality is a force of love. And we can see that some of our friends um, did a little bit of graffiti on here. You know, one of the things about this uh, exhibition is it's available 24 seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for free. Anyone in the community can come by and walk the streets and see this work. And of course, because of that, sometimes uh, individuals interact with it um, and, you know, want to get their name up there too. <laughs> they want to be part of the beauty. I get it. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is actually uh, is a group of portraits uh, from um, photographer David Newkirk. Uh, this is uh, portraits that we did for our 10th year anniversary. And so I kind of found them in one of our folders and I thought, well, if we're doing the, the current folks, I want to have, have some of the, the older folks from 10 years ago. These are the people that were just in the trenches uh, in 2011 uh, doing the work. Uh, to, and, and back when it was a, a more 
hostile climate uh, for the LGBTQ community, politically speaking and socially speaking. Uh, so these are just some of the faces of the people who were uh, really the, the, the visionaries and the pioneers, the people that really were forcing change to happen in the state. And again, you can see that QR code in the bottom right hand corner. So it's something where if you're walking along the street, you can just use your phone, scan it, and then hear some stories. Yeah. Or um, you can follow along online and you know you can go to equalityutah.com or craftlikecity.com, yep. pull up the imagery, and then of course the corresponding um, audio files as well. So our, the next one, we stand on common ground. And this one is kind of over by Gracie's on West Temple and Third South. Um, Talk a little bit of, tell us a little bit about this image that we're looking at. Yeah, this um, reflects the Common Ground initiative that we launched um, back in, oh gosh, this would have been, I want to say 2003, 2004. Uh, we were really, um, no, 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 actually, I want to, no, no, this is moving forward. Um, so in 2003, um, uh, Massachusetts became the first state to actually legalize um, gay marriage. And there was this big kind of reactionary response and a moral panic throughout the entire country and states started passing um, these uh, marriage bans and Utah did as well. Uh, we had amendment three that was passed in the legislature, which even though gay marriage was already illegal in the state, the legislature passed a, an amendment to the constitution uh, that would have prohibited any form of relationship recognitions for same-sex couples. And this actually went out to vote. And over 60% of Utahns voted against marriage equality. Now, this was a brutal moment for our community. And we so we, we started seeing these legal battles pop up. And then something unimaginable happened to our community. And that was California in 2008. California is the most progressive state in the country passed Proposition 8, which prohibited um, gay marriage in California. And that was devastating for us because the you know, popular sentiment at the time was as goes California, so goes the nation. So there was this fear that if, gosh, if we can't get marriage equality in California, uh, we're, we're never gonna see it and let alone in Utah. And it was difficult for us because we saw that a lot of the money uh, that that funneled and, and the organizing of Proposition 8 came from Utah. Um, and we had, we were at this all time, um, the, the culture war between Latter-day Saints and the LGBTQ community, conservatives and progressives. We were at each other's throats. We were fighting. Um, I was an activist at the time. We were doing marches around Temple Square. We were doing kissings on church property. We were rabble rousing up at the Capitol all the time. And we were just at each other and fighting and fighting. And at that point, uh, to really to the credit of, of the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that they started having conversations with Equality Utah behind the scenes, quietly. And we, we started having conversations about, look, we know we don't agree on, on marriage equality, but is there something we do agree on um, is, what, what, you know, what, 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 what do we have in common? And through those early conversations, we recognized that we, we believe that people shouldn't be evicted from their homes or fired from their jobs because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. So at that point, we came up with a common ground initiative um, and it was significant because it was endorsed by then Republican governor, John Huntsman. This is the first time a Republican governor had ever stepped forward and say, yeah, equality under the law is a thing <laughs> and it includes LGBTQ people. Um, and so we started um, this campaign to, um, to protect our community in housing and employment. And the first non-discrimination ordinance was passed in Salt Lake City uh, in 2009 with the endorsement of the LDS church. And from there, we took that common ground initiative and took our community to municipalities all around the state. So we went to West Valley City after that, and they passed the non-discrimination ordinance. We went to Park City. We even went to Logan. 
<laughs> we went to, you know, yes. I mean, even these conservative pockets in the state um, began to pass non-discrimination ordinances. And that was all moving us toward our ultimate goal, uh, which was to pass a statewide non-discrimination law. Well, and Troy, thank you so much for sharing that history and kind of those baby steps that it takes to get to the, you know, the ultimate goal. And then yeah. of course, from there, there's always another goal, right? Like the, the work never ends, but, yeah. you know, I think it's so important for us to think, call back and, and think you know, that was just in the mid aughts, you know, that was like know. 13, 14 years ago when that was, it's crazy to think, like you were saying earlier, how far we've come in a short amount of time. But that 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 wasn't work that was being done earlier. You know how quickly right. we forget. Um, yeah, so. I always uh, when I was an activist, uh, a grassroots activist, I um, and and when I was in the university, I hated the word incrementalism because I wanted to change now. I think which I think is kind of the beauty of youth, right? <laughs> you know, there's no patience for for waiting. Um, but really, the way that the world does change is incrementally. You know, it's step by step by step, um, and because you have to change hearts and minds while you're doing it. And sometimes if, if the law changes too quickly and the people aren't there with it, uh, then there's a backlash, um, and, and, which we've seen. Um, and we, we've, I think a lot of the, the bills we've been fighting um, are a backlash to uh, the equality, the legal gains that, that our community has achieved. Um, so, so you have to sort of, con it, these two components have to go side by side. You have to, you have to do the work of, of, of changing the laws and changing the hearts and minds simultaneously. Well, and that's such that's such great advice. And thank you for, for putting that out there. You know, for individuals that are trying to change hearts and minds, maybe within their own families, what's some advice you can give them personally? You know, how can they take some of the tools that you're using at the governmental level to an everyday person's life? You know, I, I have a, my personal ethos is that I refuse to see any opponent as my enemy. Uh, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work because all the walls go up, you get defensive, they get defensive, the amygdala fires off and people are in fight mode or they're in flight mode and, and, and you can't actually make progress. You have to see the humanity of the people who aren't quite there yet because you never know that, 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 that you don't know what their whole trajectory of life will be. I have seen it so many times, a lawmaker who has dig their heels in on some LGBT issue years ago and I've seen them soften and I've seen their hearts open and I've seen them you know, grow to become champions for our community. Uh, and so you never know. So you have to sort of see, hold a space for somebody to evolve and change. And I, you know, I, I got a lot of family members um, in, in Utah County. I got a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles and, and they have very different points of view than I do. Um, a lot of them were big Trump supporters. And I go to family reunions with them and I just make sure that love is number one, that, that I love my cousins, even though, and sometimes they, they, they wanna like sort of go me into a fight, but I just wanna let go of that and just love them as, as humans first and not, not let politics be what how it defines our relationships. Uh, and then once you get past that kind of tribal mindset, then you can actually have really difficult conversations, but with compassion and love at the forefront. And then the more that I talk to my cousins, they're like, yeah, we know Trump's an ass. We, we get it. I mean, like, I mean, you do, you, you do start to see um, people begin to shift. And then my, my 80 year old aunt, who's active Mormon, and she came over to me um, this weekend and she grabbed my hand. She goes, I want you to know that I voted for Biden. And so I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you just never know what people are going to be, but you have to get, you have to just keep your heart open. It's hard. It's really hard. Thank you, Trey. So let's talk about this next book, Hot. This is on Broadway again, um, kind of close to the Main Street corridor. And equality becomes law. This is, this is talking about a 2015 yeah. uh, initiative. Yeah, yeah. So I, like I said earlier, uh, we had gone city to city, county to county, passing non-discrimination ordinances. And finally, in 2015, um, we, we, we brought everyone together and we brought stakeholders from everywhere um, with from the LDS Church to Equality Utah, Democrats, Republicans. We were all sitting around the table saying, let's put the culture war on pause and let's figure out how we can advance um, legislation that protects everyone. 
And it was kind of a crazy radical thing. It was the first time in our country's history when a pro LGBTQ bill passed through a Republican controlled legislature. Yeah, it was a huge deal. And everybody is like, what's going on? What's happening in Utah? <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you what, I mean, I mean, and people, you know, when you, when you start to do the, these kinds of initiatives and you start to find common ground, it, it freaks people out on, on, on the extremes of both sides. So you had people on the far left going, what's Equality Utah doing talking to the Mormon church? And then for the church, you had people on the far right going, why are the Mormons talking to the queers? And, <laughs> and, and, and there's all this suspicion back and forth. Uh, but when you're working to bring people together and you're standing in that center, it's really challenging um, but this moment, and this is me introducing the bill. There's two apostles from the church there. Governor Cox is kind of in the background. Um, Jim DeBacchus is there, several other people, uh, former Mayor Biskupski and various lawmakers from both parties are all there together united, saying we are gonna find solutions. Uh, and, and we passed this bill to provide uh, legal protection. The first time in the, in the state history that we had legal protections for the LGBTQ community. Such such a marvelous landmark year for that, um, yeah. and, and to be leaders, to be and it changed state. everything, everything that comes after it because of this moment right here. And that was just, I mean, 2015. We're yeah. talking right not, not years ago. Long. That's right. Politics in action. Um, this book caught is down by the Rose Wagner Theater on Third South and about you know just shy of Second Second West. Tell us about this image we're seeing here. Yeah, this is us uh, marching at the Pride Parade. Um, just some of these amazing uh, young people. The, the, the young people in the center, um, they are the plaintiffs. We actually filed a lawsuit against the um, State Board of Education because we had this law uh, that prohibited public school teachers from discussing gay issues in the classroom. Sometimes it's called don't say gay law or, um, or we, we call it the no promo homo law because there was no promotion of homosexuality. Um, and so these young people uh, in the center were our plaintiffs. But when we filed the lawsuit, the legislature, um, President, uh, then Senator Adams, he's now the president of the Senate, he called me into his office and he said, Troy, look, I have reviewed your lawsuit. It's not without merit. We're going to fix this for you. And so the legislature repealed this, this law that had been in existence since 1997. They repealed this law with overwhelming majorities in both the Senate and the House. In fact, there was only one dissenting voice in vote in the House and one dissent, dissenting vote in the Senate. Uh, so we overturned this no promo homo law in 2017. So that was a big deal for us at that moment. Uh, and then we kept working and building on those relationships that we had established um, for years of organizing um, and, and with the Republican leadership. Keep in mind, the Utah legislature is any given year is around 80% Republican and about 90% Latter-day Saints. So if you are wanting to create change or move a piece of legislation through that body, you're gonna have to engage with conservatives and with people of faith, right? You just can't do it on your own. Um, you can yell and scream on Twitter or Facebook all you want about the injustice, but, you, but the political reality is you have to sit down with people who don't share your views and try to persuade them onto your side. Um, and so not only did, did we overturn No Promo Homo, we built a broad coalition of, of amazing uh, uh, community members um, from different ethnic communities, different faith communities. And in 2019, we finally passed a, a, a LGBTQ inclusive a hate crimes bill in the state. For the first time in, in, in our state's history, and people have been trying to do this for 20 years, where we actually include race, religion, sex, level of ability, um, sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, all of these issues, um, be, all, all these categories became protected um, in our state hate crimes uh, law in 2019. Great. Let's move on to the next one. Let's go going the wrong way there. <laughs> More victories for Utah. Yeah. And this is in front of where the Zephyr Club used to be. On oh, that's right. Oh, Zephyr. <laughs> we miss you so. Um, yeah, so in 2020, Utah became the 19th state in the country and by far 
the most conservative state in the country to ban the practice of conversion therapy uh, on minors. So this is another huge victory. This is Nathan Daly uh, at, at the podium. This is our press conference celebrating our win. Nathan was our literally our poster boy who who at, who at 17 years old, you know, had had endured um, awful conversion therapy um, in Utah County, uh, and then became a, one of our spokespeople and survivors, telling his story. Right behind him is Representative uh, Craig Hall, a Republican Larry Saint, who introduced the legislation. Um, on Capitol Hill. And, you know, this was a tough fight. Uh, we did it with, within a year. It was a tough fight, but I got to also give credit to Governor Herbert and now Governor Cox, who worked behind the scenes and really pro provided a pathway for us to ban the, this practice in the state. So, um, you know, we, we, a lot of people like to, you know, complain how conservative uh, a lot of our lawmakers are, and they are, <laughs> that's a reality, but there's also a lot of compassion and big hearts. And, and when people know better, they do better. And, and so, but we've seen that happen here as well. Oh, pardon me, I have a little technical difficulty here. Uh, well, and I think that that also, while I'm kind of just getting back to the slideshow, I think that is also something that, again, is a testament to the, the work that, that you do and kind of what we were talking about earlier about those incremental steps, right? And sitting down with individuals that are just uh, so different from, from, from you know, our, with, with, have different perspectives than what we would have and yeah. getting, getting to that common ground and, and really connecting. That's it. And it's hard. It's so easy just to see somebody as your opponent, as your enemy, uh, and to think that I have nothing in common with them. I, I was thinking about, I just went, um, I don't know if y'all know Senator uh, Jake Andereg. Um, he really was instrumental in helping us um, stop some bad bills this last session. But um, he I, he's super conservative and, and super Mormon. And I I, um, I went to lunch with him a couple um, weeks ago. And um, and went to Lehigh and we started talking and he started telling me about his great love for like Depeche Mode and sort of 80s new wave bands. And I have like this, this great love for Depeche Mode and 80s new wave bands. And so we spent this whole time talking. He was in a band actually, and spent so much time talking about our love of, of 80s music. And it was phenomenal. And I never, I just assumed that he was like this stuffy, boring conservative. And um, and, but when the more I, I talked to him, the more I realized, oh yeah, we have all these other things in common. There's more than just politics people that connect us together. And we've got to be able to move beyond politics to really see each other's humanity. Thanks for sharing that, Troy. Let's go to the next one. We can be allies. Okay, so one of the most fun things that we do at Equality Utah is our uh, annual Allies Gala. Um, and we, I, I don't know, I mean, Okay, I'm just going to say it. I think that we have the best gala in the state. All right. Well, in the Eccles Center, my goodness. Yes. And uh, this is uh, this is in 2019. Um, this is a uh, picture of the great Billy Porter, uh, an amazing uh, Broadway and television and movie star, um, performed on. The, uh, and we have local dancers and performers. Uh, we do this, um, and we and we really celebrate our allies because we know we can't do this work on our own. Uh, and we throw a big celebration with local artists, musicians, dancers, um, and we celebrate all of the success that we've had and we chart a vision for the future. Uh, so you'll see different images here. I think you see Tan France is in one of these photos there and a few of our drag queens, London Sky, I think in Gia Bianca Stevens and, and there's a, a dance troupe called Art of Chaos that we often work with. Uh, just bringing art and uh, politics and high fashion all together. It's kind of like Utah's own Met Gala. So, um, and we always have like some cool themes and people kind of come in all kinds of crazy outfits. Uh, and we will be back at the Eccles together um, on October 2nd. So we'd love to see you there. And there'll be more details that we announced at equality.org coming soon. Yeah, what are tickets going to go on sale for that? Uh, I think July 13th, which is our official birthday, uh, our 20th anniversary on July 13th. So yeah, so follow us on social media and uh, you'll see all, all of that info. And, and mark that date in your calendar. Again, what was the date one more time? October 2nd, Eccles Theater. I'm putting it in my calendar now. <laughs> Do it. All right, the power of tea. Yeah, so we've had so much success um, with the LGB community. And we also, we, we, we have made a commitment from the very beginning that we don't advance rights and protections for the LGB community without the T locked in right by our sides. We cross the finish line together. 
Um, but there's been a huge backlash uh, in our against the trans community as any minority community uh, steps up to claim their rights as Utahns, as American citizens, and recognize that the that the words equality under the law also apply to them. Um, anytime that any minority actually steps forward and claims those rights and privileges, there is always a backlash. And we have seen an aggressive backlash against the trans community all across the country. Over 30 states introduced bills to restrict the freedoms and the liberties of transgender Americans. Uh, and thankfully in Utah, we fought both of them back and won. So we've got a, um, an audio clip from Sue Robbins, uh, who is on Equality Utah's Transgender Advisory Council. Now let's go ahead and play that audio clip now. My name is Sue Robbins and I'm on the Transgender Advisory Council for Equality Utah. We have many legal struggles in the transgender community here in Utah. Longstanding, we have been fighting to be able to get gender markers changed throughout the state. And there are some judges that are refusing them. And there's actually a pending case at the Utah Supreme Court that has been there for a few years and it's just sitting. So that one is a big struggle for the community because the affirmation of our name and gender is one of the most important things for us. Additionally, we have been under attack in the last two years where the bills that are coming in are trying to take away the health care for our youth that is appropriate and affirmed by the American Medical Association and the National Endocrine Society. And with that, we've been able to defeat the bills each of the last two years, but we're seeing them start to pass in a few states across the nation and it's still in discussion, so we will be continuing to fight that. Likewise, we have the bills that are trying to remove transgender girls from girls sports. That has come up two years also in a row, and we have defeated it both of those years, but we are seeing those pass at the national level too, and it is still in the discourse here at Utah. So we have more work to do in these areas where we are under attack legally. As a member of the Transgender Advisory Council, myself and the other members of the council would come together to discuss these bills so that we would understand what our view of them were and how we would need to proceed forward, what the issues were behind these. And we work with Troy Williams on what the view should be for Equality Utah on these transgender issues. So we would then also support Troy in showing up to committee hearings and to talking with sponsors of the bills so that we could be, help be the educators to these individuals who are sponsoring the bills or who are in those offices with the sponsor in some cases. So that's very important because then we can also reach out potentially to the governor, Governor Spencer Cox, who we see sees the damage in these bills as he had made a statement that for both the ban on transgender health care for youth and the ban on transgender girls and girls sports, those bills he was ready to veto and he made a statement about it that was very emotional. So it shows that he has met transgender youth and that he understands some of the issues, at least at some level. And we have more discussions to have, but we appreciate that statement and we appreciate the show of humanity for our community that's coming out of the governor and the lieutenant governor's office. Troy, you know, I love how Sue talks about um, representation and talking about how important it is for these government leaders to meet individuals from the trans community. Yeah. Can you talk about that? And I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, there's, there's this great, uh, so this is Laverne Cox, the, the actor, she's speaking to Allies Gala. Uh, uh, six years ago, but right below her is a, a young uh, trans boy. I think he's 17, 16 or 17 now, Dex Rumsey. And, you know, Dex is someone who is just this, this courageous young man. And I, we bring him up to meet with lawmakers uh, to talk about the impact of these bills. And every time a lawmaker meets Dex, you see their minds just <laughs> opening up. And, and, and all of a sudden this abstraction this theoretical idea that they're talking about all of a sudden becomes real. And it's not a hypothetical anymore. You know, most people know, um, uh, I think it's like eight in 10 people know a 
gay or lesbian person, but I think the numbers are more like three or four out of 10 know a, a transgender person that they, that they know of, right? Um, and so there's so much work that has to be done at, at actually creating empathy and compassion, but you have to know somebody who is LGBT uh, in order to actually really, you know, for, for this issue to be real to them. And the more that we bring young people up and, and other leaders in the trans community, the more, you know, the friendships are formed. And then they, and then these, these people like Sue become resources to lawmakers. Uh, when they have questions, they, they, they don't call me sometimes anymore. They'll call Sue, which is awesome, which is the way it should be. Um, and so it's really important for visibility uh, for the trans community to be um, sort of forward facing. So when the, when the media calls me um, and wants to do a news story on trans issues, I'm like, great, let me call Sue or let me call Dex or let me call one of these, one of these other spokespeople for, the, for our community or from our trans advisory council and let them take the lead and we support them. So it's, it's really essential for us. Uh, this um, audio, we probably should update it because since we've installed this placard, um, there was that, that Supreme Court case that Sue mentioned I actually had a positive ruling and, uh, and like two weeks ago. And so now um, trans people all, all across the state can change their, their gender marker on their birth certificates uh, without any restrictions. So super huge landmark victory for that trans community. Great, great landmark victory. And um, thank you so much for sharing the story behind uh, this imagery here and about that work and how important representation is um, especially with, you know, uh, what's, what's happening right now. So thank you, Trevor. And then I believe we've got one last placat to just talk about We Belong. Love all these people. Um, yeah, so you know, again, uh, you know, we got to recognize that we often have intersecting identities. Um, like Audre Lorde talked about how there, there is no single issue struggle because there's no single issue people. Um, we all have these different um, identities that, that sort of overlap. And so we have to be really cautious that as we, as we uh, move LGBT issues forward, that we recognize that we can't um, forget our black and Latino and Latinx and indigenous community members as well. Uh, that is so essential that we continue to lift up and support um, communities of color, particularly over this last year where we have seen a global reckoning on racial justice. And it has been so exciting to see people marching in the streets all over the world. Uh, and so it, I, I have a lot of hope. I know sometimes these, these, these movements are unsettling and they're a little chaotic sometimes and they're a little scary for some people, but oh my gosh, we are, we are, we are opening our hearts to a greater, bolder vision of humanity and about who belongs. And, and so I, I, we are just committed to this work. We uh, do diversity and inclusion training for Utah companies as well. Uh, we go in and, and we, have, we have trainers of color. Uh, we have people from the trans community. Um, we have the, the whole sort of intersecting identities, um, sharing these messages with people in with, with uh, boardrooms and managers and CEOs all across the state so that we can create more inclusive workspaces so that we truly can be our authentic selves and when we show up to work, um, that we're not afraid of putting a picture up of, of our partners on the desk for fear of losing a promotion or of being you know, sort of discriminated against in the workplace. So it is so important that we recognize that we all need each other and that the success of one group um, it is really dependent on the success of the others. And that when one, one group is elevated, it doesn't mean that the other is diminished. It just means that we're all being elevated. Um, and so we have to continue that, that commitment. Um, and I think we, we have a clip, our, this last clip is from um, Stacey Harkey. He's one of our diversity and inclusion trainers. And uh, he is a, he, talk about intersecting identities. I think he talks about his intersecting identities um, here in this clip. My name is Stacy Harkey, he, him. I am a consultant and a trainer with Equality Utah and an actor and writer. <laughs> I do have multiple identities. Uh, there's a lot of intersection in my life. I am gay, I am black, I am Mormon, I'm under five, six. I got all the struggles. <laughs> um, and 
when I when I look at the LGBTQ community, especially people of color, in 2021, I think of the struggles of of intersectionality. I think we've done a lot to recognize that people are different, that people have experiences that are different, and I think that's going to become a little complex as we dive into some of these intersections, where you know, for a gay person in Utah, that can be something, or for a black man, you know, and it can incredibly white community that can be something but where it crosses it can mean something different and it might require different attention or awareness utah has been working very hard to and i say utah and i mean the people that make up utah the different communities have been working very hard to compromise work together and to essentially gain understanding and i think that's the number one I mean, that's where it starts, is we have to listen to people. We have to understand what they want, what they're fighting for, or what they're even striving to attain. And then when we understand what they want, and we understand how that relates to us, we can find out where we can compromise or where we can work together to achieve that. We know that there are several different aspects that affect Utah and our communities here. There's the cultural impact, there's the religious, there's community, and there's businesses, which is the area where Utah is just thriving right now. We're attracting a lot of companies. And as we attract more companies, we attract more people, we attract more diversity. And not to put, you know, not to throw any blame on anyone, but Utah has not always been a very diverse area. And we're finding that there are some pain points in uh, making Utah a welcoming place for companies that are bringing different types of people here as well. And there have been some situations where some companies have even said, you know what, I'm not going to recruit for certain, from certain schools in Utah because they don't understand the importance of diversity or we're not going to be a part of this institution or this area because it doesn't support um, diversity. And what I truly believe is that people aren't opposed to diversity. They just aren't. They just don't understand the ins and outs of it. And one thing Equality Utah is doing is we have an allyship training where the goal isn't to put anyone down. It isn't to punish anyone. It's to empower people just to understand where maybe some of our um, gaps in information can benefit Utah, can benefit our companies and our communities. We know that more diverse companies yield greater output as far as like profits go. We know that a more diverse team means better strategies. These things make companies better. And when we make companies better, we make Utah better. It's one of the aspects that leads to its health. I think um, a lot of times, as just human beings, we tend to think of progress as this pie, and there's only a limited number of slices. You know, someone takes a piece of that pie, that means I won't get a piece of that pie. But when we look through history and when we look through progress for humanity, every step of the way, when we make something better for someone, we don't lose a slice of the pie, we make the pie bigger. And that means that we all have a chance to progress and get better. Look at the civil rights movement. I mean, fighting um, racism and segregation and Jim Crow laws didn't mean America became less empowered. It means it became a better emblem of freedom and liberty, and we can grow and move so much farther forward. And I think the same when it comes to diversity. By focusing on empowering the individuals and creating a welcoming place for diversity, we don't limit our own personal freedoms. We're, in fact, gaining more freedom. We're gaining more insight. We're gaining more knowledge. And we have a more whole more wholesome community because of it. Such a great um, excerpt. And, you know, I really love how how he's talking about intersectionality and the importance of even how that relates to our local culture here in a business sense, which I think is good for a lot of, you know, with these being downtown um, in the business community for individuals to really hear that message. It's, it's a really exciting time, uh, and there's been such an, a great outreach. Uh, I, I see efforts from the Salt Lake Chamber. I see um, efforts from Silicon Slopes. I see so many people in the business community saying, how can we be better? And can you help us be better? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it, it, and, and we are happy to be part of that conversation and, and build allies. That's really fundamentally what this is all about, is being allies for each other. God, life is hard. And we are all, every human being is struggling through something that we don't always see. Um, and so the, the ability for us to sort of reach out and lift each other up during hard times, and this year has given us, we've seen how hard life can be for all of us. Uh, and we, are, we see how important, how interconnected we really are. Uh, that's really, I think, the, the blessing and the gift of the pandemic is that it taught us how much we need 
each other. Um, and so we're, we're dedicated to this work uh, to continue for the next 20 years of Equality Utah, lifting each other up, supporting each other to create a more fair and just Utah for everyone. And thank you, Troy. Thank you. For, thank you for being here with you know Equality Utah being here for 20 years and all of the work that you've personally done as well as everyone else, the board members, the committee members, the volunteers. And we can't wait for another 20 years of Equality Utah and to see how far we can't progress even further. Um, because it, it seems like it is, you know, the, the, the gap is decreasing in between these landmark events and these landmark bills and laws that are that are being passed in, yeah. in a positive way. And, uh, and all of that is, of course, from a number of, of hardworking activists and individuals, but thank you for your part in that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it. And it's our honor as an organization to partner with you for this exhibition. This is our third year doing it. It's so important, I believe, for the community to be have access to this knowledge and this information and this history um, about activism here in the LGBTQ plus space in, in Utah. And uh, for them to be able to access it 24 seven, you know, seven days a week, anytime they can walk um, downtown on Broadway until the end of um, until the end of June to All see for Pride Month. So fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. So we're going to wrap up now. Before we wrap up, I know Amy is going to be putting uh, a link to our survey. We'd love to have any participants today um, fill out this survey and just tell us how we can improve in these lunch and learns and what you learned today. Um, and then also, are there any questions for Troy? Uh, does anyone have any, any uh, questions or comments about today's presentation that they'd like Troy's feedback on? I'm an open book. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, it sounds like we covered it all, Troy. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for the Zoom bombers as well. We know that you're needy <laughs> and that you need attention. <laughs> and hopefully someday you'll do something productive with your life. But <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, and thanks again, Troy. And we look forward to, um, to working with you again in the future. Awesome. Thank you all. Mwah. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.